Okay, well, thanks everybody for, for saying hello to the audience that's joining us here for the next 30 to 40 minutes. We'll try and make sure we make the best use of your time uh, as we go through this conversation. Um, and, and I guess the first thing to do is let's get stuck straight into that term of digital transformation, such a ubiquitous term. We see it throughout the conversations we have with our customers. I might have an opinion. I'm sure you listening, you're going to have your opinions and I'm going to get the panel to give some views on that as well. I think from my own perspective, observations, it's really the marriage of technology to achieve uh, kind of differentiated business models. And there's lots of ways of doing that through monetization of data, greater control at the edge, new digital products and services, better customer experiences. So lots of different use cases. But I'll argue it's technology being involved in the underlying business model. Um, let me open it up to the panel and see if anybody else has got some other thoughts to help the audience get oriented in this discussion. Yeah, sure, Craig. It's Peter. So happy to, happy to pick that question up first. So I think if you if you take a step back and you look at um, you know the digital experience and digital transformation, it's fair to say that almost every industry has a form of disruption or change within it. You know, if you look at the way. Uh, the retail market in particular has had a dramatic shift to online online interaction with its customers and online purchasing uh, through to maybe the media and entertainment market, which has moved into much more of a consumption based uh, market. You know, all of those organizations and customers in those industries have had digital disruption come their way and they've had to transform the way they deliver services to their end users. So, yeah, I think there's, there's plenty of examples out there in the market, but what's the what's the kind of key link for me is all of it needs strong technology technology platforms and also strong operational models to deliver um, because you can't do one without the other and you can't transform and support your customers unless you have those kind of two two key pillars so that's really what what resonates for me in relation to digital transformation yeah great thank you peter uh, alexei tom anybody want to pick up from there yeah, no, I'm with you guys. I, I think it's all about technology and it's all about uh, ability to use technology effectively to, to you know, influence business outcomes, right? It, it's all about changing the way we operate, which in theory should lead to better experience and better results for everyone. Yeah, and Tom, you've been working a lot at the edge. What are you seeing in terms of those conversations? One of the, yeah, one of the areas I enjoy is taking things that were not digital and digitizing them and uh, that is uh, the technical term would be analog data, data in the natural world, the physical world. But if we can't digitize it, convert it into uh, ones and zeros, as you know, and then we can't process it. We can't get the insights. We can't use AI and ML you know, on that. So things like temperature, vibration, particulates, the weather, your location, time, as well as voltage and current, all these natural phenomenon out there that are in things in the IoT are becoming more and more a big part of the digital part of the digital transformation in businesses around the world. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and Scott, I know you focus a lot on our as a service uh, business model here at, at HPE, I'm in many ways yeah. going through our own transformation. You're seeing the same conversations with customers? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the other thing that I would add there is the challenge that customers have in, in addressing um, you know those changes that they need to make uh, in terms of you know from an economic perspective as well there's the uh, making those transformations that they need to do obviously mean that they incur costs and how they manage how that cost reflects in the roi is really where as a service models can come in to help them yeah i think that's absolutely true one thing i think we can all agree on is we are now talking to a much broader set of stakeholders is that right in our customer bases typically this isn't just an it led or technology mm. this isn't just technology pioneers these are lines of business pioneers these are business people looking to accelerate that next business outcome differentiate their organization their offerings in the market and technologies become the enabler uh, to that so it's completely changed who we talk to in these discussions as well i i feel like that's a big theme of the of the dx narrative Okay, so look, we've, we've kind of given some landscape um, context to our discussion, um, but that sounds like a big beast to try and, and get down into some kind of manageable bite-sized chunks. We're going to attempt to do that on this panel discussion. Uh, so let's break it down into a couple of areas that we see really emerging. I guess what we would describe at the digital edge, at, at the place where customers are creating and exchanging value in their industry, in their market, in their operating environments. 
Um, and, and I think we can see that that's kind of carved up into a couple of areas at the edge. One very much customer centric, consumer centric or person centric, let's say. One very much dealing more with the physical edge and the instrumentation and digitization of the physical edge. Tom, I'm gonna come to you later about that physical edge thing, but Pete, I wanted to start with you, maybe more on that redefine experience conversation, how technology is, is, is happening, is, is changing the way that people live and work and, and, and maybe some early observations from your perspective. Yeah, sure. I mean, if I if I start with the the work piece, actually, the way technology is changing people, the way people work. So I think most of us have got great examples of how it changes the way we live in our lives from, uh, you know, applications and home control system. But for us at HPE, we focus on how can we change that kind of working environment for, for users and, and employees within the business. And I think if you all look back at your own careers, um, those that have been in, in the kind of IT space for maybe more than 10 years, the change has been dramatic in terms of the tools and technologies. Yeah, I know certainly 10 years plus for you, Craig, I, I, <laughs> you're in that bracket. Um, so yeah, I think the technology change has been dramatic and you know, we've gone for an environment where we used to, we used to travel at all times for every, every meeting, we used to collaborate in person um, you know, all of that has changed over that period of 10 years to, we, we just can't do that anymore. We don't have the time available to do it. Um, we're not quick enough as a company to react in terms of the speed at which we need to make decisions. Um, and actually without kind of, you know, changing the work environment, you can't allow teams to collaborate pro properly. Um, and it all rolls back to the fact that, you know, most companies are operating in a global environment, even if they're, perhaps only operating in one or two countries, they've still got suppliers and customers that they'll communicate with across the globe. And you actually can't do that effectively without the right underlying technology platforms in there. So that's, um, you know, for me, that's really clear. And I think you, you've got a lot of work um, as, a, as an IT function, as an enterprise customer function to make sure you have all the underlying platforms correct and in place. Um, and probably the other aspect is security is critical in this in this space. You know, as we as we collaborate and expand the, the, the places in which we work and the devices on which we operate, uh, that inherently increases the security risk that goes with it. So that's that's probably the biggest impact we're seeing in our customers and where they need the, the most help and device. Yeah, you, you make some really interesting points about. I mean, everybody's been distributed back into their homes. We're doing remote productivity in every industry now, in every geo. Uh, this global pandemic certainly teaching us a lot about what it takes to, to, to redefine the employee experience. I'm also interested in that external customer experience as well. I, I, I'm talking to customers now that are doubling down on their digital transformation efforts with a real focus on customer experience because we're acknowledging now that what, what we're learning about the world around us is those, those organizations that have a great digital experience or have digital channels as well as the physical channels to customers, they're the ones that are being able to weather this storm, not just weather it, actually accelerate and outpace their market and take share. So that, that kind of customer experience has become really central. Anybody else got some thoughts as well on, on, on that point? I'll, I'll jump in guys uh, to, to um, both of your points. The way we're operating now has to fundamentally change from the way it was before and technology is that driver that allows that to happen, right? Think about the retail experience. Everybody knows Amazon. You buy something, you get 16 recommendations. Hey, you should consider ABC, right? You should consider this or that. Um, that takes away the need for you to think through whatever possible, you know, myriad of, of uh, permutations you had to consider. Something is actually doing that decision for you. Now, digital transformation from retail to the normal sort of bigger enterprise is undergoing the same, um, the same sort of journey, right? We're now using a lot more data to predict whatever the outcomes the business should take or could take. Uh, without having to physically assign people to it and, um, you know, spend the time actually manually processing the, processing the data, you know, coming to the outcomes. So the fundamentally how we're approaching uh, our, you know, business to business interaction is sort of following our retail experiences. And we expect everything at our fingertips. We expect everything immediately. We expect everything in sort of the utmost quality. And that yeah. can't happen if you do it by hand. It has to yeah. be powered by technology behind the scenes. I might argue, actually, that the, 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 the pandemic 
has been one of the biggest catalysts for the shift in focus towards that kind of digital customer experience. It's been a real catalyst in the conversations I'm having. Um, okay, so let, let me just quickly shift gears here a little bit. We've been talking about how technology can be applied to create those new experiences and engage your customers, your citizens, with different personas in new ways. Um, but of course, a part of creating that context about the environment in which those people are working or buying or enjoying that experience, part of that is coming from an increased digitization of the physical world as well. And so I know we've got some expertise on the panel here. Tom, maybe you could explore a little bit with the team what you're seeing about that digitization of the physical world as well to create even more context and richness in what we understand about the world around us. Well, sure. If we, if we look at it like this, uh, things, the T and the IoT, which by the way, the IoT has achieved celebrity status today, I think you would agree. Uh, there's pent up data in them. So there's existing things such as a turbine on a, uh, in a power plant, you know, generating electricity, such as a power window in a car door that is on a manufacturing line. Those things exist, but in them is pent up data to be unleashed. And that data is from, as you point out, from physical things or the physical world. And it's been uh, very interesting. My team and I have been to the edge. You know, we've been to the uh, airport edge, for example. We've been underneath uh, Chicago Air Airport with our airline partners up in the uh, tower. I've been to Lincoln Labs, which would I would call the scientific edge. I've been to CERN, you know, as well. We've also been to uh, different manufacturers. A large auto manufacturer was very interested in the physical data called vibration and if vibration can be digitized it can be analyzed as to how much a power window is vibrating because a luxury car should not vibrate it should go up very smoothly right and vibration would be a quality and eventually could lead to a defect so they're very interested in that and how do you determine uh, the vibration well with very um unique sensors as well let me keep on the theme of vibration data, which is analog physical data that would be digitized. Uh, the vibration of a turbine, which burns fossil fuels in a power plant. I was able to work with a very large power energy company here in the United States. And in the past, it was uh, people, they called them the wise men, who would walk out and feel and listen for vibration and say, oh, maybe uh, you've done that. I, I'm, I hearken back, I cast a memory back to my dad when I was a teenager, he would, listen to the vibration of my car and say, oh, you better get that fixed, right? So there's a lot of data in vibration, right? So this data, which used to be listened to or touched or felt, uh, now can be digitized and can be, here's the fascinating part, it can be compared to vibrations that are, uh, I would say, anomalous or that which would predict a problem, such as a failure, meaning a brownout or a blackout in the energy, you know, power industry. But uh, knowing that data, you can do predictive analysis, and here's where the um, artificial intelligence algorithms or the machine learning algorithms, or, or just simply uh, things like you know uh, um, averages and best Fourier transforms, et cetera, on the data, it can be fed in, now watch, it can be fed into back at the cloud in the data center, if you will, which is the corporate uh, CIO or IT systems to predict budgeting whether or not a very large amounts of money, millions of dollars need to be budgeted to replace a defective a turbine or perhaps to repair it, which could be in the tens or hundreds of thousand dollars before that repair. So this avoids, which is fascinating, the business value is it avoids a type one or a type two error. Very quickly, a type one error might be you saved the money and you didn't need it. So you could have used it to advertise or hire more people. A type two error is what maybe we're more familiar with. We run out of money you know, at the end of the month. And how do you hit it right? Well, you don't save it when you don't need it and you don't spend it when you do need it later on as well. So that business value can save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, if not millions in a particular business environment. So the power of physical data digitized first to be part of the digital uh, revolution and the uh, digital transformations going on. Uh, the business case in, in many cases is airtight and I've actually seen it with end users. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me as well. I mean, I could listen to you for hours, but th that that data and that understanding, that insight is is it's not just to uh, make some back end decision points, right? You can then flow that control right back out to the edge and, and make adjustments in real time. We talk about control, but also shifting towards autonomy and those kind of use cases. It, it really feels like that whole journey, that whole part of this conversation is, is a light at the moment. It's it's the big focus area. 
Real quick, let me point out, you hit on something very important, that the shelf life or the value of data changes over time. For example, if you're going uh, down the road at <clears throat> 55 miles an hour in the United States or 80 kilometers somewhere else, how soon do you want to know that the object in front of you is a little girl or it's a garbage can? And so that data doesn't matter once you've passed it effectively, right? Unless there's a litigation and you're going back historic data. But my point is true. If the turbine is about to catch on fire, how soon would you like to know that? Mm. You know, would you like, by the way, would you like to send everything to the cloud? Mm. Well, I can't even make a cell phone call today and it's 2020, right? Without <laughs> saying, can you hear me? Right. So that's the case for computing at the edge, right? For edge compute to get immediate reaction. And then it's value. It can be archived. There are some cases where you need to save the data for seven years, right? Or you want to compare it to another uh, plant as well. And it's all about how fast you can take control and react to the yeah, data in yeah. many, many instances from, like I said, autonomous vehicles to electric plants to even ordering inventory, you know, in a retail yeah. situation. How fast can you react to make sure you don't lose the sale by not having and, inventory? And, and, and I mean, that, sorry, go on, Scott, sorry, dive in. Uh, I was just gonna say, it reminds me of a uh, situation that we had with a, a Green Lake customer at the sailing group that on the dance supermarket group and they were um you know in a really competitive situation so it's not the same as knowing the difference between uh, whether it's a garbage can or a little girl but there's still that immediacy and the importance of of what the value of the data is at different times and to stay competitive in the market they were in they needed to really be um on point with uh having minimum amount of shrinkage so so uh, products that are gone past their date and can no longer be sold. So having access to that data quickly and, and being able to use that data to effectively stock was the difference between profitability or not. Mm -hmm. And actually the investment that they had to make in order to have that power, they were able to lean on the GreenLake model in order to do that. So, so having that as a service picture in there is really, really powerful for them to be able to only pay for the data as they consume it, but actually have the data at the point that they need it. That's fascinating. So we're getting into not just the technology driven business outcomes, but powering it through different business models <laughs> underneath it as well. And I really think if you start connecting those two conversations, we've just been having about better digital customer experience or employee experience, and then you connect it with understanding better in real time, the physical world, you, you put those two agendas together and you've got a powerful digital edge story. Pete, we're doing some pretty interesting stuff, digitizing the physical world, the workplace to, to go beyond just remote collaboration and better collaboration tools, right? Actually changing the dynamics of the workplace as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's two areas I'll talk about in a second, but I think linking back to Tom's point around data, you know, there's so much, information out of there but it only becomes valuable when we can actually draw some some meaning out of it and make and make active decisions on the back of it so i think one of the things that's really accelerated a lot of the work that we do in point next and, and you mentioned it uh, towards the start of the call um, craig around uh, you know the challenges with the pandemic at the moment in the market so that's um absolutely had to shift the way we provide workplace services to to our our consumers our employees inside the business and you know everybody's aware of the switch to remote working i don't need to uh, you know make people aware of that we're, we're communicating here through remote platforms um so that that need is there in the market and we focused on two things one is how do we blend that kind of physical and virtual experience um together so we we have a solution that focuses on how can we create an intelligent workplace uh, for, for for an organization and that's simple things like providing location aware um, tracking and technology um, for employees. That's things like allow employees to uh, allow visitors to gain access to the building uh, without actually physically meeting them, um, you know, accessing into the facility system. So we've had a, we've had a lot of focus around that. And, and you might think that's less relevant now that fewer, fewer of us are attending the office, but actually it's, it's really, really critical to create that personalized experience. Uh, and I'll give you one example where that intelligent workplace solution has actually delivered value is, um, you know, things like linking into facility systems in buildings so that we can control uh, the, the, the air temperature or the heating in a particular part of the building when it's unused or when it's overused, you know, we can actually tailor that experience and you can do that by linking into location aware technology. So that's, that's kind of area number one that we've we focused on in point next. Um, the second thing we've started to look at is to take some of that technology 
to help customers return their employees to the work environment. Um, so HPE as an organisation has looked at things like, you know, how can we do touchless entry into the office uh, to avoid multiple touch points and reduce, uh, you know, reduce chances of transmission of the, of, of, of the pandemic and of COVID-19. Uh, we've also looked at things like um, temperature and fever detection system, as well as social distancing. So it's how can we take you know, some of the great technology that we have at the edge, some of our great services capability and marry that up with the data to make, make informed decisions. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the only thing I'll close on is just, none of this works in isolation unless you can collect the data, interpret the data, and, and as I said at the start of my, my piece here, turn that into meaningful decisions that you can make as a business. So speed is really, really critical. Um, you know, yeah. Tom made that point in his section some of these decisions need to be made really, really quickly. And, and that, that's the sort of thing we're focusing on as, a, as an organization. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic examples, um, Pete. And, and actually, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, we, we're, as human beings, we, we, we crave that, that physical contact and anything we can do from a technology perspective at the edge to, to, to make those workplaces safer and, and be able to get people to be able to interact face, face to face again sooner. Uh, the better, as long as we're doing that in a very safe way. Well, okay, look, I'm excited about all of the innovation that's going on um, out there at the Digital Edge. I also wanted to bring uh, Alexei and Scott in a little bit more as well, because you know what, I think that this kind of innovation and this kind of speed of innovation that's going on at the Edge, that, that those business leaders are demanding even more of their technology experts inside their company. And, and, and we talk in HP a lot about organizations being cloud enabled in order to have that kind of service oriented mindset and the ability and the speed to deliver uh, new technology um, at, at the kind of pace and consumption models uh, that, that the organization is looking for. Alexei, let's take that apart in a couple of ways. You know, first of all, organizations have a legacy, right? I mean, they, they, they have heritage, they have technical debt. You know, what are you seeing in terms of how, how is that whole modernization agenda playing in as a big part of the stimulus to this digital transformation narrative? Absolutely, and then just to create piggyback off of what Tom was saying, you know, ability to use data more effectively to rationalize the right sort of outcomes is what's important. And the problem we have now, the most of enterprises over the years acquired some sort of technical debt. It's technical from the legacy IT infrastructure, it's technical, it's legacy from perspective of, uh, you know, procedural operational activities. Uh, everybody's struggling, right? Most enterprises are struggling, the budgets are tight, everybody is asked to proverbially do more with less. Um, and this is where cloud comes in, right? Cloud allows you to accelerate some of those decision making capabilities and maybe become a little more effective at what you're doing. Uh, and part of that initiative of rationalizing how to get to the outcomes faster is, uh, is a decision to modernize your applications and uh, potentially move them to a different location. We all know the premise of cloud, only use what you need, right? And only pay for what you use. But the, the problem with that though, back to piggyback on Tom's comment is, you gotta figure out first what should go where. Right. Cloud by itself is not a blind uh, destination. Let's just move everything to the cloud. What if you need to make that decision quickly to the turbine, right? Or next to the turbine quickly. So you have to figure out what you should do with your application estate and how to modernize it. If it's a web application, maybe you put it in the cloud. If it's an ERP, I don't know, maybe you keep it on prominent, you know, in a better sort of hyper conversion infrastructure. And if it's a split millisecond decision making, maybe you keep it next to the source of data. Right. So obviously, as part of Point Next Services, we offer uh, what we call a right mix approach when we help enterprises rationalize what should go where and how they should approach it. But uh, the, the fact that enterprises are undertaking this whole modernization journey just shows that they're, they're starting to think about the, the why. Right. Why are we doing this? And, you know, what are the benefits from this? Yes, uh, Scott. Yeah. I'm just I'm, I'm looking at you because I just I think you must be in this in this tunnel every day of the week having this discussion. What are you What are you seeing out there? Yeah, right. Exactly. And I'm thinking of a particular example here that probably um, emphasizes a lot of the points that Alexi's making, and it and it really speaks to our partnership with Microsoft as well here. Um, so it's it's our customers' customers. I'm thinking of in this instance. So uh, we have a, a service provider customer called uh, Peering One Group, and uh, 
they were seeing exactly the challenges that Alexei was talking about with their, their customers. Um, they were loving that Azure experience, but there, there were just instances for various different reasons, whether it was around you know, um, data sovereignty or, or speed of decision-making, latency issues, whatever it might be, that was holding them back from making that decision to put everything in uh, the Azure public cloud, but, but they loved the experience. So um, by, you know, by working with us and being able to leverage the Azure stack portfolio um, and the as a service model, they could give their customers that look and feel of the same public cloud experience, but still retaining the control of it in an on-prem environment. Yeah, I and mean, it's a fantastic example. I, 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 we, we keep hearing about, you know, the work we're doing around helping to find this right mix, as you were saying, Alexei, and um, we, I think we're beginning to understand how the industry is beginning to agree with HP that this is a hybrid outcome, whether it's all the way out there at the edge, as Tom was talking about, real-time computing, avoiding latency, whether it's on-prem, those big ERP systems you were talking about, Alexei, uh, or whether it's developing for for that next wave, that new generation of applications. And actually, let me just touch on that point. You know, we, we talked about kind of the, the, the big heritage um, estate needing to be tackled because we need agility into that in order to be able to support all of this data that's coming in that we're looking to process in order to be able to innovate. But what about developers, Alexei? They, they, they I mean, they, they seem to be the new kingmakers uh, almost Mm -hmm. might make an argument there somewhere there's another rising champion in that conversation but they're so important as well aren't they in terms of what they're looking for that shift away from big monolithic applications start to break that down into a much more loosely coupled set of apis what are your thoughts what are we seeing in that particular space absolutely and you guys probably all have heard that famous mark andreessen's quote from back to 2011 software is eating the world it certainly is. Uh, if you think about cloud, is definitely an enabler. And again, back to Microsoft Azure, is definitely an enabler for any of the uh, accelerated ways to, to develop software and deploy features fast. Um, if you think about the old days when we just store our, you know, parameters in a file, and that was sort of the extent of it. Then the cloud came along. We've got infrastructure as code. Now I can put the entire data center in the USB stick. I, even that is no longer uh, the bleeding edge, right? We now get to the point that it's everything as code. It's, it's security as code. It's uh, you know governance and policy as code. It's you know very soon it's going to be outcomes as code. You just you type what you want and it's going to be there. Um, and the whole concept there is the acceleration of code is what allows the business to deliver the value faster, right? If you do things manually you just never get it done just in, you know just not enough time in the world but if you can script it if you can automate it if you can chunk it up that that what makes it uh, sort of be more productive and part and you probably heard this too obviously everybody knows that the, the next big revolution is the containers so part of the ability to automating everything and writing code look you can deploy it faster you can put it in, in a small chunks of code which can protect secure you know monitor uh, govern you know etc 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 so we're now literally in the middle of what I think it's a new IT revolution around containers. Uh, obviously, HP came out with um, our HP Esmero container platform uh, based on the Kubernetes you know, open, uh, open container architecture. Uh, Azure has its own you know, Azure container service and Kubernetes service. So there's a number of tools and capabilities that uh, developers have you know, in front of them to help them accelerate the development, absolutely. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, just to link these two things. Uh, sorry, Tom, dive in. Well, uh, may I make a quick point on container mania? And uh, the uh, beauty of a container, many know, has to do with uh, its simplicity, as Alexi said, combined with its portability, ease of failover, and its cloud friendliness. You know? And what I wanted to add to that is, although those attributes are being exploited, as uh, we have with our Esmeral container platform, software, there's work going on in HPE labs that are handling non-container friendly applications, which uh, can be called stateful as opposed to stateless, meaning they rely on and they have dependencies on that. And our ability to be able to use some of these new technologies to create persistent storage mm. and the uh, preservation of the statefulness allows the benefits of the container uh, and cloud friendliness, but to be able to use the legacy applications or the stateful applications. So uh, this is a discussion of, uh, I would say, Alexi addressed more of the greenfield and where the future is going, and indeed it is. And I wanted to just add the adjunct that the brownfield, meaning being able to 
uh, take care of those applications. Many are OT applications that are very stateful is something that we're offering. So it's not a matter of one or the other. You have to throw out or containerize all your apps or create new ones, but rather we have ways in the future uh, coming very quickly uh, to accommodate that. Best of both worlds. Incremental mm-hmm. innovation on existing technologies always wins. Yeah, fantastic. And that's what we want to do. That's a great update. Thank you, Tom. A great interjection on that on that point that Alexi was making as well. And, and I sort of see that as being completely deployable at the edge as well. We're not just talking here about hyperscales and, 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 and big four-wall data centers, right? We, we, that portability is increasingly shifting. We talk about cloud everywhere, don't we, inside yeah. HP? This is fascinating, and I know we don't have time, but this whole idea about um, how do you bring a cloud experience to the edge? Uh, has, there are, uh, we've identified 14 different challenges in the edge versus the data center. And if I call a cloud, a, a cloud is a data center that nobody's supposed to know where it is. If we have that definition, then there are 14 different uh, issues that we deal with when we're in a retail store, a manufacturing line, a crop field, a military you know, battlefield, the edge, you know, if you will. And handling containers out there and getting that experience because you can't really separate the cloud experience from as a service. Yeah, absolutely. And we are pioneering as a service at the edge for uh, the compute storage, of course, uh, um, Wi-Fi, as well as uh, the OT applications that are out there. Fascinating uh, challenge, and it's hard. But we uh, well, embrace complexity. I, I tell you what, I'm going to say if we if we get good following for this for this video, they'll have us back to start exploring those 14 cases at the edge as well. We might put that into another one. All right, okay. let me let me quickly start to bring some shape to this. So um, what I'm hearing everybody talk about, whether it's at the edge in terms of using technology drive experiences or insight and control at the physical edge, whether it's about using uh, technology to to build a more adaptive uh, and, and agile supply chain. Everybody seems to be talking about some core common themes. Like one of them is intelligence. Everybody keeps mentioning AI and machine learning. Of course, we're using AI ops and and, and driving lights out um, operations and and we're using AI to help drive some of those IoT use cases. Um, I just quickly come to uh, Alexei if I can. Um, I, I have this feeling that the chief data officer or data scientists are becoming the new kingmakers. And I was referring to that when I was talking about developers. Um, are we seeing that? Is that what you're seeing? I definitely are. Uh, so interesting. I mentioned Mark Andreessen's quote of software eight in the world. I was just in a podcast recently, actually listened to a podcast recently. And one of the quotes was data is eating the world. It's no longer the software, which it's a very interesting perspective. It's hard to disagree. I mean, software is everywhere, but data is just absolutely proliferating, right? Data is everywhere in Satan the world. And you can see, Maybe maybe it's a harsh statement, but I'm not sure if we've given data enough respect in the past. We've collected it, we've used it, we've sort of processed it, right? Did a bit of analytics on it, but never to the extent we do it now. And you see every day there is a, a new title or a new new position being open, and a lot of it is a chief digital innovation officer or you know, chief data officer. Why? Because people realize that that's a massive asset that needs to be protected, you know, cared for aggregated and then most importantly monetized right so absolutely it's uh, it's becoming a new trend in the industry and and the monetization aspect uh, tom it appears to me a lot of those use cases in terms of monetizing that that level of insight and intelligence is happening at the edge as well right? i mean that's really where the use cases are driving that that that, that conversation forward right yep i actually monetize uh, the three m's of business value at the edge monetize as you said is one m maintain um, and then uh, also to um, monitor, you know, as well. Uh, monetize has a lot to do with pushing uh, things. One, one day I woke up, I looked at my um, Apple iPhone, uh, which connects me perpetually. I call it perpetual connectivity to the Apple company. And the application for the Apple Watch was on there. It was pushed. And so that's a monetization effort with being connected at the edge. This is a consumer retail example that we're talking about. So what did I do? What do you think I did? I, I pressed on it. And by the way, the people there were so beautiful. Um, the men had great abs and everybody was so happy because they had the watch. So the inference was, Dr. Tom, you already have the app. Why don't you just get the watch, you know, take that next step. <laughs> that monetization in the consumer sense with perpetual connectivity, but all the way to um, who doesn't want to predict the future? Right. You know, we, and we mentioned that as well, right? With artificial intelligence algorithms as well. You know, who will I marry? Will I be healthy? Will I make enough money? When will Dr. Tom stop talking? Everybody wants to know, you know, the future. 
<laughs> as well. And we've been enamored with it, right, since, since ancient times with crystal balls and astrology, right, and tarot cards, palm reading, the list goes on. But when you can predict business, right, and you're con from all the way from the condition of your equipment, and that's data. And anyone who's studied um, statistics or data analytics knows the more samples you have, the more data you have, yeah. the higher the probability of your outcome, your predicted outcome will be. And that's why, yeah. uh, like I, I like to say, if, if you like data, you're going to love the edge. <laughs> because the, well, the data I, is the biggest, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm, I'm going to just keep going through what I think is common and core to everything you guys are, are saying here. Um, Scott, it appears to me that a lot of conversations actually impact the, the customer's underlying operating model. Right? So this isn't just a technology conversation. Ultimately, the value is only realized when we change the, the, the processes that, and, and we change the way people work as well. Um, I know a lot of customers are coming to us around that as a service conversation because that's a key enabler for them to be able to pivot into more innovative um, types of conversations with their business. W what are you seeing? You're at that cold face all the time. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting listening to a lot of the conversation that's that's going on here um, around that. And you were talking about, you know, the cloud being the the data center. You don't know where it is, uh, Tom. And, uh, you know, the, I think what we're seeing is as we face those challenges of bringing that experience to people, regardless of where they are, it's a, it's a more distributed cloud reality. And the, the challenge that people have then is, is, is do they have the skills necessarily to manage those different operating models that are required there? So, you know, um, what we're looking to do is unify that experience. I think, I think every, everyone wants to do that, is, is, is provide a unified experience that allows, you know, people to focus more on delivering those outcomes, whether it's about redefining the experiences or accelerating development or any of the other great things that we've been talking about. If companies are so bogged down and having to manage all of this, um, then you know that's uh, really difficult for them. So with, a, with an as-a-service model that's delivering that distributed cloud, you really want it to be that, that simple for the customer that they're taking the insights and making the decisions based on it and everything else is experienced as an outcome. And, and that's where we see coming into play with, with um, parts of our portfolio like GreenLake Central that really deliver those insights and give the customer control to see whether it's um, about utilization or cost across all of their mixed environments and, and um, distributed cloud as, as, uh, as, we're, as we're saying, um, and, uh, and also even into things like compliance. Mm. Well, actually, that, that's a great segue. Can you, can you jump in there, Craig, for just one second on the on the operating model. I think it's um, it's really important to get that right for customers, uh, and I think a, a lot of organisations miss that. J just by moving your workload or your application to a cloud does not solve all the operating challenges that exist behind it. Um, you know, it may change the type of operation that you do, you may not be patching and managing infrastructure quite so much, but still the way you maintain the application and the way you drive the value out is still critical. And I think that's um, that's missed a lot of the time actually. Um, and see, that's the work, some some of the work that Scott and the GreenLake team do is providing that operational layer as part of running the environment, because you have to have that to deliver the value out of it. Yeah, I, I can completely agree. In fact, if I was to say what's the number one cause of, of organizations stalling, and what's Forbes latest quote is around 72% of, of enterprise organizations are stalling in their digital transformation. It seems to me it's this critical element around the operating model and getting that right, um, which is really proving the hard thing to do. Most of the customers I'll speak to will talk about having to roll out a cultural change program alongside all of these great technology ideas that we've been talking about to try and get people into a kind of digital first mindset in order for them to be able to exploit the value of what it is that we're talking about being deployed here. Yeah, absolutely see that. And actually, Pete, can we, can we stay with you? Because uh, you know, Scott just mentioned compliance at the end of his, uh, of his, of his answer. I was thinking that this is, this is other big chunk of the enabling kind of capabilities organization. We're talking about data, but we could be talking about people's data, right? And this issue of, needing to be not just compliant you know, with, with regulations, we're all in the post GDPR world right now, not just resilient, not just cyber secure, not just connected, all of these kind of great buzzwords, but that feels like that's a real big ticket item as well. That's, that's, that's a kind of um, 
enabler, uh, barrier to the whole progress of digital transformation conversation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge challenge and, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of terms out there at the moment, but the, the, the one I've heard most recently is kind of zero trust model. That, you know, every, every kind of communication and structure, uh, we have to assume it's, uh, it's going to cause us a problem and it's going to cause us a challenge. And yeah. we talked a little bit earlier on the panel about, um, you know, the challenges with the pandemic and the need for remote work. You know, we've now got situations where people are accessing their, their workplace systems from different devices that may not have the same security governance. Uh, we've got people accessing corporate devices from home locations through, you know, endless broadband routers and providers. Um, it's just accelerated in the last three months those challenges that exist and you have to have you know good strong technology in place good software technology to spot those threats and and try to make recommendations on what to do with them but you also need a strong operational model so when that threat comes in you know what decision do i make about the data i've just received and also how do i learn from it and and don't do the same thing again um, so yeah that, that's that's the pressure that exists there in the market mm -hmm. And it's a it's a balance, isn't it? Because of the old security angle was well, if it's if it's firewalled and protected and air gapped, then it's ultimately secure, but it's ultimately useless at the same time because nobody can get to it. And I, it sort of feels like in this digital era, we're talking about opening up to much broader ecosystems, competition and cooperation going on, and 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 you know maybe this this opening up of data and 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 using platforms to surface new innovation. Uh, through that cooperation is really key and also tom it, it strikes me that you know with 5g and wi-fi 6 and pervasive connectivity we could be connecting literally everything to this huge mesh of of connected things and data this kind of zero trust conversation this 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 security angle at the edge must be huge in the conversations you have too yep it absolutely is if we it, i think it's instructive to look at an intelligent edge as the three c's connectivity compute and control Obviously, you can't engage with the edge or edge to cloud if you're not connected. And the compute and the ana analytics go further. Uh, but now control. After you get the insight, we don't stop there. Because yeah, I think you'd agree with me, insight is almost useless unless you're in a research mode if you can't act on it. And part of action is control, controlling your business as well. Uh, an instructive metaphor is when you go to a physician, a medical doctor uh, may connect with you and then... Uh, she may take um, all kinds of uh, data, do all kinds of analysis, make bar charts, beautiful pie charts, and then give you all the data, and it has a bunch of measurements you've never heard of, and then says goodbye, see you next year. Well, you've missed the last part is control. Like in my case, Dr. Tom, you need to control your diet, or you might need to you know, control this or get a test or whatever the case. So that last step yeah. is uh, the beauty, and that is part of the connectivity um, idea because if you're not connected to controlling a thing, perhaps uh, an, auto an autonomous vehicle or controlling your inventory, controlling your ordering, or controlling the delivery, understanding where your um, you know fleet is in a, in a delivery application as well. And uh, 5G, I believe, has a strength um, because uh, we all want really, at the end of the day, one radio to do it all. We have multiple, right? You have on your phones multiple Bluetooth, near field, of course, cellular and uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, what if one radio could do it all? And I'm not necessarily suggesting 5G in its first incarnations can, but that's a driving factor is to the simplicity and the ability to have just one you know, radio. And, and not on the supply side, if you're making those uh, uh, devices, uh, there's a drive to go to one because you can enjoy the benefit of not having to test the test matrix of four different radios. One's on, three off, you know, two on, you know the idea here. Right. So those drivers of 5G, in addition to its promises, of course, higher bandwidth, more connectivity, um, as well, high reliability. Uh, in addition to the promises, there are those societal, you know, factors as well. And uh, if I can make one other point real quickly, this dynamic, this societal dynamic of opposing uh, 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 contention here, we are during this COVID period enjoying some of the productivity of being remote. And we've, um, I, if I can get philosophical here, we've annihilated distance and sometimes time. But right now you have to, you know, we're recording this. And if you're listening to it, you've annihilated both distance and time dimensions of, of interaction with humans. That sends productivity through the roof. Contrarywise, there's a desire for us to engage with humans and be with them. With uh, 5G, it's going to help keep that annihilation of time and place dimension of productivity going, even after 
uh, you know, the post in the post COVID world, even after the virus is defeated and we move on. Uh, very fascinating to blend the technology and the social elements uh, as well. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And I, I like that philosophical touch as well. I personally can't wait to be able to get back and, and, and see everybody in, 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 in the flesh and, and, and get back to some face to face. You do owe me a drink. Yes. I, I, and I will buy that as soon as we get back together again, Tom. Uh, perfect. I'm going to hand the last words over here to, uh, to Scott, actually, because Scott, it seems like the overriding global consideration, whether it's you know, new product innovation at the edge, whether it's reassembling the supply chain, it's all about an as a service model uh, right now, right? I mean, if for me, almost we could argue as a service model is the engine of the DX business model in many ways. Uh, so I'll give you some closing thoughts on that as well, please, Scott. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a, a pretty big statement that to say that it's the engine when you hear about all of these things that are going on um, around all the innovation, uh, some, some great, um, stories and insights from from the team here, um, but fundamentally, you know, there is a um, a business decision to be made behind this, and and kind of the decisions being made um, over the last ten years, and we see eighty five percent of people who are uh, using public cloud services are you know truly up beyond satisfied with that service, and there's a number of reasons why they are, you know, obviously agility being a key a key factor in that, the ability to move fast and have the resources they need to enable all this innovation, um, but only pay for it at the time when they actually use it, right? So no risks of having to make a large technology investments and, and cross their fingers and hope that it pays off. Um, and that's huge. And obviously, you know, to the point that uh, Pete was making earlier about um, the simplification of, of things by driving an as a service um, delivery model, which you know is is uh, is bringing complexity, uh, bringing simplicity to the complex. Um, so, which is which is key to any as a service model. And of course, you know, I touched on it already, the economics. But you know, I, I can't say it as well as as our own customers. And if I remember at uh, our own Discover event a couple of years ago, we had um, York from from CGI, one of our key customers, who who coined the phrase that he was realizing with GreenLake as a service model, 100% commercial utilization and saw his total cost of, uh, of his uh, solution decrease by 70% um, because of eliminating the need for over-provisioning, um, because of um, redeploying his, his uh, resources onto innovation and driving the business forward rather than on focusing on you know, um, fighting the fires on a daily basis from an operational point of view. And um, yeah, so I, I would agree with you. you know, I think it's the engine that drives it. It's, um, and it's, it's fundamental to it. And what we're offering with, uh, with HPE's GreenLake offer, I think on, on top of those other factors that I mentioned there is that control. So gaining insights through our tool sets like GreenLake Central, including our analytics portal that, that talks about the detail I mentioned earlier on utilization, capacity planning, uh, driving insights on, on um, compliance and, and across the operational model. It gives a single pane of glass and we're even you know, allowing to select what the next workload is that needs addressed and, and everything will just happen for the customer. They're really consuming outcomes. Scott, so, thank engine, you so much. Yes, enabler, enabler for these innovat innovators. Yeah, thank you so much for giving us the, 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 the cut out there to the end of the discussion. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for joining this call, for all of my panel guests that have hopefully kept you entertained for the last 30, 40 minutes uh, exploring the world of DX. If you want to know more, please visit HPE's virtual booth. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for your time and we'll speak to you all soon.